Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our broadcast. I'm Stan Stovall, your host for today's broadcast, and our topic today will be fall prevention. And we're fortunate to be joined by renowned lecturer and researcher, Dr. Courtney Leiter. Dr. Leiter, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Stan. It's great to be here. Okay. And Dr. Leiter will be sharing some of his insights on falls and fall prevention with us this afternoon. But before we get started, Dr. Leiter, we just want to open up the phone lines and the fax lines right now at the beginning of this program and take some calls as they come in throughout the course of the program. So if you have a question for Dr. Leiter, there's no need to wait for that official Q&A session. Go ahead and pick up the phone and call in right now and we'll get right to your question. And we also have a live studio audience with us tonight. And audience, you want you to feel free as well to ask any questions questions that you may have during the course of this program. Good enough? Okay, they say good enough. Now, Dr. Leiter, when we get uh, to a call uh, or one of the audience questions, we're going to break uh, in your presentation and we'll go ahead and take that question as it's appropriate in the program. Sound good to you? Sounds great to me, Stan. Okay. All right, keep in mind the lines are now open. If you'd like to call in your question, then you should dial 1-800-953-2233. If you'd prefer to fax your question, then you should dial 1-410-786-0123. Let me give you those phone numbers again. For the phone questions, 1-800-953-2233. For the fax questions, 1-410-786-0123. All right. Now, Dr. Leiter, what do we need to know about falls and fall prevention? Well, Stan, the incidence of falling among the elderly is quite large. In fact, 30 to 50 percent of community dwelling elders fall on an annual basis. In hospitals, about 4 to 12 falls occur per 1,000 patient days. 50 percent of elders in long-term care will fall annually, and in fact, 70 percent of all emergency room visits by elders are directly related to falls. Okay, this may sound like a, uh, I'm going to say, dumb question, but I think it's safe to say that we all probably assume we know what a fall is. But from your particular field, give me the technical term of what is considered a fall. Quite often, people think of falling as this dramatic thing that they'll see on, on a soap opera or whatever. A fall, in its most simple terms, is whenever you inadvertently are on the floor. It could be a slip, it could be a slide, you could be not even falling on the ground, but falling from one level to the other. Mm -hmm. Anything that is inadvertently, and they find themselves on the floor or the next level, that is what we operationally define as a fall. Mm -hmm. And you gave us some statistics early on in your presentation. I had no idea uh, the problem of falls was so vast. Absolutely. In fact, um, it, falls are the sixth leading cause of death in, um, among elders in the United States. Incredible. Three to five percent of elders fall will lead to some sort of fracture and one percent will lead to a hip fracture. It's these hip fractures are of particular concern because research has shown that hip fractures significantly increase the risk of death. 30% of elders who fall will fall again and 50% of elders who sustain falls will die within one year of falling. Women are twice as likely to sustain serious injuries, but men, and in particular Caucasian men, are 22% more likely to suffer a fatal fall ending in death. These are some pretty alarming statistics you just gave us. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, I had no idea that simply from a fall or perhaps a hip fracture that it could lead to death. Why specifically is that? We're thinking a broken bone heals. There should be no other problem, right? Well, and that's a great, great question. Um, quite often what will happen is that the fall may not in and, in and of itself cause the death, although there are times when we see hip fractures where the person may become get uh, infected. And from the infection and or sepsis, they may uh, actually die. Quite often why falls are so serious is because they render the patient or the elder immobile. And it is that immobility where you may set up conditions such as pneumonia uh, uh, as one that will eventually cause the death. So the fall is the precursor, but it is the sacrilege of all these other conditions that may occur and that therefore the elder will succumb to mm -hmm. death. With so many people falling and so many problems coming from falls, I would imagine uh, that the care required to support uh, these people, it's got to be very expensive. Oh, the cost of falling is staggering. When you think about the cost of hospital bills and the cost of interventions that are in place, the number is immense. Although we don't have an exact figure 
um, are known right now, but we estimate that it costs between 200 million and 300 million annually to manage uh, falls in hospitals. Yeah. I would imagine no one here can certainly argue that uh, falls can be a huge problem, especially among the elderly, and that quite frankly, everyone really is at risk. But it does seem to me though that some would be at greater risk than others. Uh, are there some identifiable factors when it comes to falling? There are, Stan. In fact, we've identified quite a number of factors that increase the risk of fall. There are numerous risk factors for identifying those residents that are at risk for falls in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a direct correlation between the number of risk factors and the potential for falls. Thus, when you have more risk factors in a case or in an elder, you tend to have a higher potential for falls. Certainly makes sense to me. We can divide our risk factors into two basic types. One type being those intrinsic risk factors, that is, those biological or physiological factors, and then we have extrinsic risk factors, which are things we can perhaps control in the environment, whether it be nursing homes, the home, or a community setting. Now, what I want to do is talk about these two types of risk factors more closely. Mm -hmm. When we look at intrinsic risk factors, we see there are many of them that are really age-related. As we get older, many physiological and anatomic changes occur that may place an elder at risk for falling. For example, decreased muscle mass may lead to poor back flexibility and stability, decreased lower extremities, decreased knee strength and flexibility, as well as poor endurance. These may all place the elder adult at risk for falling. Also, impaired blood pressure control, which could be postural or orthostatic hypertension, is a major issue. The, the resident or the elder will stand up, they become hypotensive, which leads them to becoming lightheaded and then they may actually fall as a result. Mm -hmm. Some additional issues include foot problems such as ingrown toenails or bunions or poor fitting shoes. Acute and recent illnesses such as depression and anxiety are all risk factors for falls. Mm -hmm. Now I understand that, that, that all of these things uh, certainly are part of the natural aging process. So is there anything that we can actually do about these type of problems that seem to be just sort of uh, a natural progression of getting old? Absolutely. I think we can be very acutely aware of them, Stan. That's the main thing. If we are aware of the possibility or the probability of a problem, then we can watch for it and do whatever possible to mitigate the problems it may cause. Another problem along those same lines are sensory changes that normally occur with age, including such things as poor vision, poor hearing, as well as poor proprioception systems. So for example, Elders may find it very difficult to delineate between different surfaces when walking or placing their hands along handrails. These sensory changes are quite often normal in the aging process, but they do place the elder at risk for falls. Cognition and altered cognitive status may have the potential to increase the risk for falls. Certain cognitive conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, multi-infarct dementia, Pick's dementia or Parkinson's may have cognitive components that can cause the elder to become confused, <laughs> which will increase their risk of falling. Certainly makes sense. Um, and I can see where uh, you know mental status and the clearness of thought would certainly uh, figure into uh, the problem if it's going to be significant or not. All right. Uh, do we have a, oh, we have a call? We have a question from the audience. Yes, ma'am. Is it possible to prevent falls in every person? That is an excellent question. In fact it is almost impossible to prevent falls in every single person because we are not with our elders 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. But what we can do is try to identify those factors that may place that specific older adult at risk. Mm -hmm. As I was about to say, that I can see where mental uh, status, uh, clearness of thought uh, would certainly figure into uh, whether you have a significant falling problem or not. Absolutely. Speaking of thought, Stan, interestingly enough, a major risk factor for falls that most people don't realize is the actual thought or fear of falling. Because when someone is afraid of falling, their level of anxiety may increase and they may actually take more hesitant steps. Mm -hmm. They may even shuffle rather than lifting their feet up in a, a more normal position. So it's this shuffling gait 
that definitely increases their risk of falling. That's a real catch-22, almost a, a self-fulfilling prophecy that uh, uh, I, I fear heights, so therefore I'm going to fall, so to speak. Uh, how do you deal with that situation? Absolutely. You must be a doctor, Stan. It's rather like being on a high ladder and constantly telling yourself, don't look down, don't look down. And of course, sooner or later, you look down. Mm -hmm. One major intrinsic factor that is only indirectly related to the aging process is medication. Studies have shown that people 65 years of age and older take on average 9 to 13 medications per day. In addition, 70% of elders may self-medicate with over-the-counter medications. We know so little about various drug-to-drug -drug interactions that a high amount of medications being taken may significantly increase the risk of confusion as a side effect or the interaction of those medications. This increases the elder's risk for falls. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that, that unexpected uh, interaction of drugs uh, certainly aren't the only possible problems. What about medications that we know will increase the risk of falling? Oh, there are medications that have been shown uh, through research and in the literature to, uh, to indiv individually increase the risk of falling. Such classifications as the antihypertensives, for example, can be quite problematic in our older adults because they tend to cause the blood vessels, the arteries, to, to, to dilate or to open up. When this happens, they don't constrict as well, and so when the elder adult stands up, they may become hypertensive and fall. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I mean, at least for me, because, uh, you know, blood pressure medication would be uh, one of those things I would not think uh, of considering when it comes to increasing my risk or my, my elderly grandparents' risk for falling. Absolutely. Another category of medications that actually will place the older adult at risk for falling are those classifications that we know as the sedatives mm -hmm. and the hypnotics. Um, they have a, a, a huge potential for increasing the risk of falling because they actually can confuse the resident or the resident, if in the case of a sedative, may actually become uh, uh, sleepy or drowsy. Some of the other things that you want to think about um, are the antihypertensives, as I said, as well. Another similar uh, medication group is the diuretics, drugs such as Lasix. Diuretics may keep the elder up at night, going to the bathroom multiple times, and increased frequency of the trips to the bathroom, particularly at nighttime in the dark, will certainly increase the risk of falls. So the use of diuretics should be closely monitored, especially at nighttime. It's just a matter of odds. The more you, the more you do it, sooner or later, you're going to trip and fall. And it certainly makes perfect sense. Uh, but I don't know that, uh, that I would have thought about that. There are uh, other drugs that wouldn't seem to pose a problem, but often they do, mm -hmm. particularly in the over-the-counter medications. I'm not picking on, on any one specific drug, but just for giving an example. Fix 44 is a basic harmless decongestant, but it can cause confusion, which makes it a risk factor for falls. Further, some over-the-counter medications may contain alcohol, which the older adult may not be aware of, so they may take this medication, have mental status changes due to the alcohol. Mm -hmm. It seems that uh, while these are certainly intrinsic factors uh, when it comes to fall, uh, these are certainly not beyond our control. These are things we can take charge of and make sure that we uh, are alert uh, to the possibilities of a fall. I agree completely, um, and these are not all of those are, are, are out of our control, and in, at least in many cases, um, we can control them. Mm -hmm. um, and the extrusive factors are even more under our control. Okay, give me an example of that. When we look at, well, there are a number of extrinsic risk factors that can place the elder at risk for falling. One is poor lighting. In poor lighting, elders may stumble or bang their feet or their arms on their way from point A to point B. For example, from the bed to the bathroom, and this can increase their risk for falls. Another risk factor is slippery floors. Any sort of liquid on the floor, whether it be soda or juice or even water, can change the properties of the floor surface and increase the risk for falls. Okay, all right. I, I, that makes common sense. I would have guessed uh, both of those things would be a problem. Also, improper assistive devices can be a significant risk factor as well. It is important that an elder receive a careful and proper evaluation when they are being provided with an assistive device 
to ensure that the height of the cane or walker is correctly proportional to the height of the elder's body. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of older adults in the community who share assistive devices with one another. Mm -hmm. So it's so important for elders to avoid this practice because the bottom line is one size walker does not fit all people. You know, I thought a cane was a cane was a cane, you know, uh, but obviously not. And certainly with walkers, I can see that the, the height of the patient would certainly have an impact as to whether or not that's really going to be a help or it's going to hurt you as you try to make your way. Uh, and by the same token, doctor, I would imagine residents should not uh, be permitted to use other people's assistive devices. That's absolutely correct. A walker may be helpful in maintaining the balance, but only if it's the right size mm -hmm. for the user. Okay, anything else on, on that subject? Absolutely. Inadequate bathroom fixtures are another major problem. It is critical that elders have proper fixtures, such as bars on the commode, so that they are able to raise themselves up. Bars or hand holes on the tub and or shower are also a necessity so that the elder can support him or herself when performing those activities of daily living. One major culprit in many falls is a cluttered room. Mm -hmm. Nursing home rooms as well as individuals rooms at one's personal residence are quite often small and tend to have wheelchairs or walkers or knickknacks or and other cluttered uh, items into the small space. So staff and family members and caregivers need to stop, look, and think, and ask the question, what in this room or this house would increase my loved one's or my own self chance of falling? You know, when I was a nurse practitioner in a, um, a, a housing and urban development senior housing complex in New Haven, Connecticut, I also made a practice of not just seeing my elder adult patients in the medical office, but I would also do an apartment inspection and remove anything that I thought impeded a smooth path from one room to the next. Yeah, we're talking about things in general. I've got another one for you. How about pets? dogs, cats. Uh, I know I have a puppy at home right now and every time you try to climb up the stairs or down the stairs, he's right by your feet. That could lead to a nasty fall. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think, and you know, there are many nursing homes that actually in particular that will have pet days where you may have a dog or you may have a cat visitation. Visi kind of visitating. And the reality is those animals should always be on a leash and be supervised because as we get older, sometimes with poor vision, mm -hmm. we may not see the dog running past uh, past you or the cat and you trip and you fall. Exactly. So we must be very concerned to make sure that when we do have pet days or, 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 or uh, in a facility or in a home mm -hmm. that the animal is actually supervised. Yeah, you're talking about room clutter and you know there never seems to be enough room to store all the things that you have. We can't exactly make the room any larger so you have to go the other course and remove the clutter. Absolutely and I mean I'm not geriatric yet but I will tell you um, I suffer with clutter as well. What I recommend is no. that people, <laughs> yes, Dan, <laughs> is that people, as much as possible, try to remove the items that may impede the walkway between the bed and the bathroom, especially at night. I see most often falls occurring when the elder is attempting to go from the bedroom mm -hmm. or from the bed to make it to the bathroom mm -hmm. is, a, is a very problematic area. And yeah. Yeah, that's an easy fix. That is something that is very doable for everyone. Clear out the clutter. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Another thing uh, is the use of throw rugs and loose carpets that should really be avoided because elders can easily slip or trip on the carpeting. Uneven flooring surfaces should be avoided wherever possible. As I mentioned earlier, elders commonly suffer from proprioceptive changes that may impede their ability to differentiate between flooring areas of different height or pitch. So having to negotiate these sorts of areas can be most problematic. Also, I suggest removing cords and wires, anything that may increase the instance of them tripping and then subsequently falling should be also done. I also believe that wax floors should be avoided since that floor surface may be more slippery when wet. They look nice, but they could be dangerous for you. Absolutely, Stan. Right. Okay. Dr. Leiter, we have another question from the audience. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Dr. Leiter. I was wondering if you could do some discussion for us of devices that could help align our elders when they're in chairs or wheelchairs. Absolutely. There are many older adults that sit 
um, a lot all day in wheelchairs or chairs. And when you have assessed that that elder perhaps has an alignment problem, things such as uh, wedges can be used to give them proper alignment, pommel cushions can be used to, to keep them aligned. So anytime I look at an older adult and I see they're not sitting straight up like I should be, um, and they're sliding to one side or they're sliding under uh, um, on their chair, Putting wedges, pommel cushions will help to keep them aligned, making sure that their feet are, firm, are, are planted firmly on the ground so that the risk of sliding out of the, the chair is, um, is, is reduced. Okay. You know, Dr. Leiter, you mentioned earlier that, uh, for example, it always helps to have, uh, for example, in the bathroom setting, if you have something that you can grip onto as you're perhaps using the commode or getting out of the bathtub, some, some handles you can grab onto to help you get out so you can avoid a fall that way. Moving to the bed, how about, uh, you know, on the sides of bed, bed rails, uh, would that be a good idea to keep people from rolling out of bed? Because I've heard of that happening before, which can lead to a broken hip or even worse, you know? Well, Stan, um, that's actually not the case. No? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. I see them in every hospital I've been in. I'm thinking, it's got to be good. They're in the hospitals, right? Absolutely. Okay. There have been studies that have shown that the use of restraints, and including bed rails, and bed rails are a form of, of restraints, mm -hmm. can actually increase the risk of falling. When a facility reduces its use of restraints, the residents' risk of falling have been shown to actually decrease. You're kidding me. Absolutely. <laughs> what happens is that patients who are restrained by bed rails especially may want to get out of the bed. Okay. So they try to climb over the railing. They are much more likely to fall during this process okay. than if they were simply had the side rails down so they could get out of the bed. Okay. For some patients that are prone, and, and I have patients like that when I w uh, was a nurse practitioner in um, the nursing homes in Connecticut, who were prone to climbing over rails, um, you may wish to place their beds on the floor mm -hmm. to help to mitigate that climbing over and then sustaining a, a permanent damage. Okay, certainly good to know that. Uh, but again, what about the problem of if you've got no bed rails, the rolling problem, possibly rolling out of bed, is there an alternative to bed rails? Absolutely. One of the things that, that we were implementing in one of the, my uh, nursing homes was the idea of having actual electronic monitors that you can actually watch the patients more, more, more closely. You can actually also in beds use pillows that may actually be used to, to wedge the, the, uh, the elder in there. Mm -hmm. But I actually like the use of bed monitoring and censoring so that we can tell when an elder may be you know, trying to get out of the bed. You can, there, there, there are sensors you can place on the actual person, there's sensors you can place on the bed so that the staff can be alerted that there is more gross motor movement going mm -hmm. on where you may need to um, assist the resident. Yeah, keep an eye on them very Absolutely. Okay, Dr. Uh, before we continue, I'd like to uh, give uh, everyone uh, those fax and phone numbers again so you can call or fax in your numbers if you have a question for Dr. Leiter. Uh, to call in your question, you should dial 1-800-953-2233. If you have a question you want to fax it in, then you should dial 1-410-786. 0123. Again, by phone, it's 1 800 953 2233. For fax, it's 1 410 786 0123. The lines are open right now. They will remain open throughout the remainder of this broadcast. So go ahead and get on the phone or fax and send us your question. We'd love to answer it. All right, now, Dr. Leiter, uh, since you've identified uh, many of the contributing factors for falling, I'm assuming that there are also some sort of risk assessment tools that can be used to help to sort of quantify these risks in any given situation. Absolutely, Stan. Concerning the potential for falls, a clinician should think about the activities of daily living, cognition and emotional states, health problems, incontinence, medications, sensory deficits, neurological deficits, and social history, especially for the use and or misuse of drugs and alcohol. We can cover all of these areas by thinking of two basic components to a fall risk assessment. The first is a basic physical examination. The second, we want to assess their balance and gait. When we first look at physical examination, we want to think about what cognitive issues may be present. So the use of a mini mental status exam questionnaire to see if the elder has a cognitive impairment um, uh, is the first step. 
that any clinician uh, would want to do within a nursing home, the home, or a doctor's office, etc. Second, because hypertension and postural hypertension may be a major risk factor for falling, we also want to check for the occurrence of both of these conditions. Third, the use of a Snellen chart to assess visual acuity is important because impaired vision can be a major contributing factor to falls. Mm -hmm. Certainly makes sense. I've got a question for you right now. When it comes to assessing a patient based on a questionnaire format, uh, being honest and forthright on that questionnaire by the patient's part, that's critical, isn't it? Absolutely. And you would hopefully not only perhaps elicit the, uh, the answers from the patient or the resident, but hopefully you can elicit information as well from the caregivers, from the staff, so that you get a real comprehensive, well-rounded approach of what is actually occurring mm -hmm. for this particular uh, patient or elder. Yeah, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, when you, when you have a toothache, it's hurt you for like a, a week or so, as soon as you walk in the dentist office, it doesn't hurt anymore, whether that's <laughs> fear management or whatever. When it comes to assessing a patient's gait, uh, you need a fair and accurate assessment of what their real gait is like, not what they think the doctor wants to see or what you'd like to hear, correct? That is absolutely <laughs> correct, and that's why it is essential that when you're looking at doing an assessment, it is a multi-dimensional assessment. Mm -hmm. So you're hopefully not just ascertaining information from the actual resident or the elder, but from all and many sources from the physical therapist, from the nurses, from, from, the, from the caregivers, from the family, from the spouse, whomever you can get to give you an accurate and comprehensive uh, view of that elder. Okay, now since uh, you've already identified intrinsic risk factors, it seems very logical that the first step in the, making that uh, fall risk uh, assessment would be to first look to them and make sure you're getting some other feedback as well, correct? Absolutely, okay. Stan. However, probably the best indicator of a risk for falling is when we your balance and gait assessment. Right. There are several tools that we can use to assess this. One is the fall efficacy scale, which measures how confident the individual is when performing their activities of daily living. A major risk factor for falling is the fear of falling, as I mentioned be before. So by utilizing this instrument, we can get a sense of how fearful or not fearful that elder may in fact be. The specific balance confidence scale is another tool that can be used to assess how fearful that elder may be of falling. Mm -hmm. Finally, the Tenetti Mobility Assessment Scale allows us to assess both gait and balance. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the fear of falling being a potentially a contributing factor, uh, for our people who are listening and watching right now, put in perspective what exactly that means. What happens when you have that basic fear? Let's say if you're coming to a set of steps uh, or some, some areas that you're not familiar with walking, how does the fear take over and affect your, your physical motor skills? I think what tends to happen, Stan, is that it's the, you, you get almost a buildup of anxiety. And when uh, the elder is anxious, when they would normally have perhaps a normal, mm -hmm. even gait pattern, what you begin to see is more hesitant steps, more small steps, and it's the small, almost like childlike steps that actually may increase the risk okay. for the elder to actually fall. Because it's unnatural for them to take those kind of steps. A Absolutely correct, okay. Stan. Okay. Now, you mentioned several different ways of, of measuring some of these. Uh, how are these scales actually used? Sure. Let's start with the first one, which is the fall efficacy scale. As I said, this scale assesses the resident's confidence in avoiding a fall. This is important since we know that the fear of falling is a major risk factor mm -hmm. for falls. If this instrument is completed correctly, it should take about no more than three to five minutes as long as the elder is cognitively intact. There are 10 variables that you would want to assess and using a Likert scale from zero through 10 with zero being not at all confident and 10 being completely confident, we can get a sense of where the elder is. These are the variables that will, will be reassessed with regard to the elder's level of fear involving in each of these activities. So one of those activities you ask, well, I'll tell you, Stan, how well are they cleaning their home? Are they fearful of that or not? And you would grade it. Can they get dressed or undressed? 
can they take a bath or shower without the fear of falling or what level of fear of falling they may have? Can they go shopping and complete simple shopping tasks without the fear of falling? Can they get in and out of a chair? Can they go up and down the stairs? Can they walk around their, their neighborhood or nursing home facility without the fear of falling? Or at what level of fear of falling that they may have? Can they reach into cabinets where they have to lift up on their feet? Can they answer the phone? Based on how the elder answers these questions, you can get a sense of how much fear they are feeling. If the average score is five or less, you should be concerned that they are afraid and therefore at a higher risk for falling. The second scale that can be used is the specific confidence balance scale, which is like the efficacy scale in that it tries to assess the confidence that the individual feels when doing basic daily living activities. This scale is used just like the self-efficacy scale, but this time the individual's level of confidence is rated on a 100-point scale on a number of variables, such as walking around their house, their neighborhood, or nursing home facility, walking up and down the stairs, bending over and picking up their slippers from the floor, reaching for a small shelf item or putting something away on a shelf, standing on their, on their toes and reaching for something, sweeping or vacuuming the floor, walking outside on an icy or slippery surface. Again, based on the individual's responses to these questions, you can get a good sense of how confident the person is with regard to the fear of falling. Okay, Dr. Leiter, we have a, another question from the audience, uh, so let's go ahead and take that right now. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Dr. Leiter. My question is, when is a fall assessment um, supposed to be completed? When should it be completed? That's an excellent, excellent question. And the answer is, I believe a fall assessment should be completed ongoing. If you have a resident um, who is being admitted to the nursing home, they need to have a fall assessment done within the first the, uh, time of admission. I also think it should be done on a quarterly basis as their conditions may actually change um, depending on certain comorbid conditions, acute illnesses that may occur. Also, when that patient or resident actually has a fall, you want to have the team come together to decide what were the, the factors that, that contributed to this person's fall? What can we do to make sure that, that hopefully that doesn't happen again? I always train my staff that the minute I see a patient walking into the nursing home or I see a patient in outpatient clinic, I am assessing their risk for falling. It should be an ongoing process throughout the elders stay in a nursing home. If they're in a community setting, I'm always looking at my residents for the, for the, for the potential of fall. If they come to an office for a visit, I'm assessing their gait, their balance. I'm looking at everything to make sure what is their risk. So the easy answer is, from admission, uh, uh, per, uh, every three months, uh, if there's a change in, in status and condition, but also every time they are in the dining room, you should be thinking about what is the risk of my patient for falling? Are they sitting up firmly in their chair? Are they slouching? What's going on? It should be almost continuous in the back of, of, of your, your, your mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you for thank your question. You, you know, we, we've been talking about tools that you can use to uh, do risk assessment for falls, and they, and they all seem to be uh, very effective, but aren't they really based on, on the elder's own perceptions of what their abilities are? And, and are there any assessment instruments out there that are based on the clinician's objective or point of view? Absolutely, and probably the most important scale is the Tenetti Mobility Assessment Scale because it is the only tool by assessing both mobility and gait that you can truly get a sense of the level of risk that this elder adult faces with regard to falling. The Tenetti Mobility Assessment Scale has two basic components. One is gait and the other is balance. Now let's take a look at balance. In balance, you are assessing six different variables. Sitting balance, arising, Standing, my favorite one, Stan, is the nudge test, the 360-degree turn, 
and how the patient goes from the standing to the sitting, sitting down in a chair position. With the sitting test, look at how the individual sits. Is he or she leaning, sliding in the chair? How is their posture? Is it perfectly aligned? In this case, the person would be rated as either a zero, which means they are leaning or sliding, or a one, which means that they are quite steady and safe while seated. Mm -hmm. For a rising, see how comfortable the individual is when rising from a sitting to a standing position. You can rate this on the scale of zero through two. At zero, the person is unable to rise from the chair without help, while at a two, the person can stand up without even using their arms for support to stand up. Mm -hmm. I, I've got to ask you about the nudge one. Uh, and, and we're talking about literally just sort of nudging you to see what your balance is like, whether you'll stand your feet or not. <laughs> oh. Absolutely, Stan. And of course, when you're doing the nudge test, you always want to make sure that you have, you, you have your hand behind them so when you nudge in the front, you don't create a fall yourself. Okay. So absolutely. Okay. So when you're doing the assessment, uh, the scales are not the same for each variable in this particular assessment, is it? That is correct. So for some of the scales, you would use a zero to two, while in other scales, you would score a zero to one. And I will say, in the Tenetti scale, it clearly helps you to figure out when the uh, elder or the adult is a zero, a one, or a two, depending on the specific subscale. Very interesting. This, I know this sounds somewhat complicated, but it really is not complicated once you get the hang of it. That is the advantage of the Tenetti Balance uh, uh, Gate Evaluation Instrument. It's very simple to use. When you have a clinician that's trained, you can probably complete the assessment in about 10 to 15 minutes. Hardly any time at all. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Now, for the standing test, you want to see how steady they are within the first five seconds after arising. Are they leaning? Are they standing solidly in place? Is the feet planted firmly on the ground? Now remember I told you about the nudges. I want to repeat it one more time because it's my favorite, favorite of, of, <laughs> of the, uh, of the uh, subscales. Literally what you want to do is when you want to use the palms of your hand and you gently nudge the elder in the sternum to see how well they can able to hold their balance. Remember being very safe so that you put your hand behind so in case you nudge and they fall back you're not you're not the problem so gently nudge making sure you you, you provide uh, safety after the nudge test the clinician should have the person turn 360 degrees when they are doing this watch closely to see how well they are able to keep their balance during the rotation and finally check to see how well the patient goes from the standing to sitting down. Look at both and overall how well did they do this and also check for any sort of aberrant movements that may occur on the way down. Are their arms flailing around? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Is it a smooth transition sitting down? Okay, so we, we've done the test. How do you determine a score and how do you interpret that? Absolutely. On the scale, what it will say is, from, from Dr. Tonetti, a score of less than 10 would indicate that the resident is at high risk for falls. Mm -hmm. and, and this is all assessing balance? That's correct. That's correct. But the second part of the Tonetti Mobility Assessment Tool looks at gait. In this case, we are assessing the actual plantar movement of the feet. So one variable that we would examine is the actual length and height of their steps looking at how long and how high the right swing foot is versus the left swing foot. To do this, you would have them actually walk one, maybe two feet, and look at how they're swinging out their right and their left feet. Another thing that you would examine is their step symmetry, as well as their step continuity. Is it symmetrical? Is it, in, is it flowing? Or is it rather, what I would call, say, staccato, but is it, is it choppy? Mm -hmm. You want to be sure to watch to see if one leg is higher than the other. For example, all of these things could indicate an individual is at increased risk for gait immobility or instability uh, 
for that resident. Okay. Let me just remind our viewers that our phone lines are open, Dr. Leiter. If you'd like to call in your question, the number you should dial is 1-800-953-2233. If you prefer to fax in your question, that number is 410-786-0123. All right, as we can continue here, uh, any other factors that uh, would be taken into consideration on this? Absolutely. Well, beyond the actual step, you want to take a look at the elder's trunk. Mm -hmm. How stable is their trunk when they are walking? Their gait stance can also provide an important indicator. Is their walking stance quite wide, which indicates an increased risk for fall? Or is their stance more normal, indicating good stance abilities? Mm -hmm. Again, the score here will give you an idea of the individual's capabilities. A score of less than nine in this section would indicate that the person or the elder is at a higher risk for falls. Yeah, it would sound like you can get a, a pretty solid assessment of a person's, uh, not only their abilities, but also their risk without having to spend a great deal of time uh, or putting a lot of stress on the individual as you do the assessment. Exactly. With these assessments being so quick and easy to use, there's no reason why they shouldn't be utilized as much as possible. Mm -hmm. The biggest risk is an individual who isn't known to be at risk. Okay, so we have all of these risk factors in mind, uh, and these are things that you know are very common sense oftentimes, mm -hmm. and we're having our assessments uh, of our patients done. What should those who work with the elderly do to try to prevent falls? Based on all this information they've gathered on all of these tests, now it's time to put it into action. Absolutely. Okay. When we look at a fall prevention and fall prevention programs, it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. Fall prevention is just not in the domain of nursing or medicine, but it really is a problem that belongs to all of us. We have to all own it. So when you're thinking about implementing a fall prevention program, it needs to involve all of the necessary disciplines, nursing, medicine, physical therapy, occupational therapy, it could be podiatry, as well as perhaps orthotics, and the general staff. We need to be sure that our programs and care plans do as much as possible to prevent falls, while realizing that we cannot prevent every single fall within an individual resident or a nursing home. Mm -hmm. The way that we do this, in my opinion, is to ensure that all healthcare professionals are involved and working together to create a successful program. A fall prevention program is simply not on a mission every six months, every two weeks. It's a constant thing that staff interacting with residents should be constantly thinking about what is the level of risk? What are those factors that may place that individual at risk? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned practically every healthcare professional who would deal with the elderly and trying to assess a, uh, a risk of falls and injury from that. Uh, one you left out, I noticed, families got to play a part in there too, don't they? Absolutely. Okay. Families and caregivers are, 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 are essential. Yeah. It's everyone's problem and everyone's challenge. We, mm -hmm. we need it all. Mm -hmm. It all really basically requires more than just a basic uh, resident level program and, and certainly a lot more than just a slogan, be careful, don't fall down, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The first thing that we have to remember is that falls are a system issue and are not the fault of the resident, the caregiver, the nurse. So in order to implement a successful fall prevention program, we need to make sure that it is implemented at the system level. Most of what we will discuss applies to both elders in nursing homes as well as those elders that live in the community. Okay, well give me some specific things uh, that, that, that could be done to prevent or, or would be included in a fall prevention type program. Absolutely. One of the things that we've learned comes from the FISIT project, which is frailties and injuries cooperative studies for intervention techniques. This was a group of seven control studies looking at what were the best interventions to prevent falls from occurring among our elders. Interesting, what they found in those seven studies, looking at these studies, and they actually did a meta-analysis, was that exercise and balanced training when put together with health education did decrease the incidence of falls. Mm. So exercise should be a key component of any fall prevention program. Mm -hmm. 
the exercise should focus on balance, strengthening, training, strength training, because when muscles are strengthened in the gait and the trunk, it will help to decrease the risk of falling. Okay, you mentioned the word exercise and a lot of people sort of panic. Uh, they envision, <laughs> does that mean I've got to do power squats or big bench presses? <laughs> what, what kind of exercise are we talking here? Good point. <laughs> When we think about what specific exercises, uh, I'll tell you, within the, uh, uh, the RCTs that were actually done, to, uh, and looking at uh, uh, what, what exercise, and there were several different types of exercise in there, uh, to see what decreased the instance of falls, mm -hmm. what they found and what they concluded was no one specific exercise was the key. So generally, any basic exercise program combined with balanced training can be effective in reducing the incidence of falls. Things that will increase endurance should also be encouraged like walking. Um, I actually promote, um, and, and there's some literature out there that, that supports this, the use of Tai Chi mm -hmm. is very popular. Some senior centers, gyms, and even uh, some nursing homes actually offer courses in Tai Chi. Alternatively, the availability of something like an aqua aerobics, um, where you're getting uh, the swimming, et cetera, uh, um, uh, step aerobics, uh, or anything that can be used to increase the resident strength, balance, and endurance should be encouraged, uh, along with, of course, the education that it's okay, it's absolutely okay to help them get over the fear of falling, okay. all working together. Okay, we shouldn't be uh, caught up in the misconception that if we're talking about falls, it deals with the lower extremities, therefore the exercise should be limited just to the legs, the hips area, right? Absolutely, okay. and that's why I absolutely promote swimming, because swimming is one of the best exercises that actually works out mm -hmm. the entire body and most of the, the muscle groups. Obviously, when we're looking at, uh, at exercise programs, this should be obviously in consultation with the physician or nurse practitioner, and as well as bringing in physical therapists in there as well to plan a program that is specifically tailored for that particular resident because once again, no one exercise works in every single elder adult. Okay, sounds good. What else could we include in a fall prevention program? Yeah, and I, and, you know, I made a little crack about a slogan. Slogans do help. If they're effective, they'll get you thinking about the things you should do, right? But what are some of the other things we should include in that uh, prevention program? Absolutely. Another area of which a fall prevention team has to be very cognizant is medications mm -hmm. and their effects. As I've said before, medications can be a major risk factor in falls. Most elder adults take a large number of daily medications and research has shown that there are groups of medications that clearly place an elder at higher risk for falls. These include the analgesics, which should be given for pain, the antihypertensives, the sedatives, the anhypnotics, as well as many others. So anything that can be done to decrease the potential of polypharmacy will therefore decrease the likelihood of confusion or sedation and therefore decrease the likelihood of a fall. So a fall prevention program should also take great care to correct any sort of visual or auditory problems that may exist. This can include ensuring that individuals have annual audiology consults and evaluations and that they can see an optometrist or an, or an ophthalmologist on a regular basis so that they make sure that they have glasses that are for their, for their specific eyes. I think it goes without saying that ensuring that the elderly can see as they are walking will greatly reduce their likelihood of suffering a fall. Mm -hmm. We have another question in the audience, uh, oh. so we'll go right to it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Dr. Light, you've talked a lot about educating health care providers. Does educating the patient about uh, fall prevention help decrease the incidence of falls? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it goes without saying, the more that we can educate our patients about what are the right things to do in the area of falling, i.e. Uh, uh, clearing a path, making sure that um, if, for example, you have uh, furniture and you may have sharp, sharp edges on the furniture, that that area is padded. Anything that we can do, putting on night lights at night so that, the, once again, the path from the bed to the bathroom is clear, is lighted, they can see, putting on their glasses before they, they, they uh, walk about. Anything that we can do to educate them to look for those 
factors that may increase their risk is greatly important. The same thing I will add is that also educating their spouses, their family members. So always remember, look, listen, see what's out there. What may be a risk factor for me that may fall? So education along with exercise and endurance training is the best uh, prevention, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for your question. You know, when we talk about prevention, a lot of the things that you have listed so far, they, they are so common sense, but oftentimes they are so overlooked. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, another issue that I think needs to be addressed by a fall prevention program is, here we go again, the fear of falling. I can't stress that enough. As I stated before, this is a major risk factor for falling. So we need to look at perhaps behavioral th therapy and see how we can get our elder adults to move beyond the fear of falling and work with them on a cognitive level as well to reduce this fear. It may be an intrinsic risk factor, but you know what? It can be worked on. Yeah, oftentimes that, that fear has been developed because they took a nasty fall, isn't it? <laughs> and they don't want to do it again? That's absolutely, <laughs> that's absolutely right. right. And we know, for example, the fact that one has fallen increases their risk of falling again. Okay. What about some physical issues uh, within a healthcare facility? Uh, are there program factors that should be uh, considered there? I know uh, uh, there are many things that we should actually think about um, uh, uh, from an extrinsic factor. Physical adjustments are a major component of any sort of successful fall reduction program. For example, lighting is an issue that a facility must address if it is to prevent falls. Mm -hmm. Areas of poor lighting need to be avoided, and bright lights should be provided in common areas, particular in hallways and stairwells. At nighttime, a night light is crucial so that residents have a clear, visible path from the bed to the bathroom. Floor maintenance is key as well. Slippery floors must be avoided, for example, by placing rubber mats by the sinks so that splash water does not create a hazard. I will also say, for if the resident has slippers, for example, that they have non-skid slippers so that they, when they're walking, they're not slipping and sliding. So anything that we can do to, to, to create a less slick surface, whether what is on their feet or on the floor, is to be uh, promoted. Incontinence or other open room spills and liquids must be paid careful attention to in order to ensure that the floor is kept as dry as possible. By the same token, you should make sure there are few uneven walking surfaces. With visual changes in the elderly, they may have difficulty recognizing a change in height or level. Therefore, reducing the steps and keeping things as much as possible to one level will help to reduce the incidence of falling. And you mentioned this before, no loose carpeting, no throw rugs, because that's a quick way to fall, isn't it? You're learning quickly, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely true. Uh, clutter is not your friend. You want to minimize it, especially at night. Uh, Well-traveled pathways, clear them away. Um, such as, I keep going back to the bed, to the bathroom, because I have seen in my practice many falls occurring from that path. Bathroom to the bed, bed to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I would also say, be sure that the nurses and clinicians, clinicians work side by side with physical therapy to ensure that any assistive device that are used are correctly sized and are appropriate for that elder for whom they are in fact intended to. Okay, we can't stress uh, the importance enough of uh, handrails, making handrails available. Absolutely. Um, handrails are, are well appropriate and ample bathroom assisting fixtures are a absolute must. Handrails and side rails for the commode and for the bathtub shower are very important to ensure that the elder does not slip and fall while trying to use these fixtures. A commode that is too low should have a handrail on the commode itself because residents may slip and fall as they're trying to sit down. While we're, we're in the area of fixtures, furniture is another concern. It is important to assure that furniture is of the right height and construction for that particular individual. If a chair rec requires a drop of three inches to sit down, elders may have problems with slipping and falling. Therefore, it is important to either allow them to feel the back of the chair and then lower themselves or have a jumper seat so that they may sit without 
falling. Mm -hmm. These all sound pretty universal. Is, is there anything else? Uh, I, I'm telling you, you pretty much have covered the gamut there. <laughs> well, there are some other things. Um, you know, they should limit their alcohol intake. Um, when, when, out when outdoors, they should avoid slippery surfaces, mm -hmm. use extra care when getting perhaps out of vehicles uh, that may be transporting them from, from, from uh, one place to, to another, and for whatever, ask for assistance when needed to help them get out of a car to help decrease their risk for, for falling. Also, some nursing homes and community dwelling uh, elders have pets, as we mentioned before. They should make sure that the dogs are on leashes and are always accompanied because, as we mentioned before, elders may miss them while walking and trip and fall over them, mm -hmm. which injuring themselves as well as the, 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 the pet. They should not be left to just wander around in, in a facility or in a home. Trust me, I've done that myself. <laughs> I've been tripped up by my pup. Uh, listen, at least back, uh, uh, back east, uh, we've been dealing with some very cold weather, uh, wet, snowy weather, icy conditions on the sidewalks and driveways, what have you. Uh, you know, people do have to go out, uh, but at the same time, if you are prone to falls, perhaps you should always have some assistance when you go out. Absolutely. I, I think it's, it's always important, especially in the Northeast, um, to, to be sensitive to, uh, to slippery surfaces and not be too proud uh, to say, I don't need assistance in, yeah. getting, in getting out and walking, up, uh, walking about because um, mm -hmm. it may save their life. Yeah, I've heard real horror stories about people taking nasty falls and they end up breaking their hip. I, I hear it's one of the most painful things you can, you can possibly go through. Uh, there's a recent invention on the market, Correct me if I'm wrong, something called a hip protector that, that people can, can wear to protect from broken hip? Absolutely. There are uh, um, hip protectors have been around for a couple of years now, but for those older adults who we who have a history of falling, okay. or and I use them or recommend them for elders who may have brittle bones or, or from, from osteoporosis to protect the, the, to, to protect the hips, and literally, it, if you think of almost like an, an NFL player um, uh, that, that's wearing padding, you literally put it around the hip area, put on their 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 normal garments, so they, their hips may be a little bit more wider. But at least, if there is a potential for fall, it acts as a great cushion. Also, for people who you, you may be concerned about um, uh, uh, for for head trauma, who may fall a lot, putting on helmets to, to once again protect the head uh, from trauma is also very important. Some of the research in the hip fractures have shown that actually by using these hip fracture pr protectors have actually decreased the rates of hip fractures in about 30 percent. So mm. they should be used um, for people who have a history of falling. Mm -hmm. And we should go back, we mentioned this earlier about, about these hip fractures, they can actually become a fatal situation, not necessarily because of the broken hip, but because of some problems that can exist after you've broken your hip, correct? Absolutely. I mean, hip fractures is probably the most serious, serious uh, concern for any clinician because um, when you have an elder who has a broken hip, mm -hmm. the, the, the potential for complications um, or the sacrilege from that hip fracture could be fatal. Mm -hmm. And I often think of, of patients who, you know, slipped, fell down, broke, a fr made, had a major uh, fracture, and then two weeks later died because they got pneumonia or, or they became septic or whatever. So even if the hip fracture in and of itself doesn't uh, uh, cause the mortality, the sacrilege from that is, can, can, will, oft, not will often, but can um, uh, kill them. Yeah. So it's important. Yeah, and something I, I have to admit my own ignorance, and we go back to this whole thing about the bed rail thing, and, uh, and maybe I'm old school, but I, I've seen a lot of bed rails in, in hospital settings uh, when, we've had, uh, when I've had convalescing elderly relatives at home. We got beds that had side rails on them, but you're, you're telling us that's not the way to go. I get asked quite often whether or not uh, the use of side rails on a bed actually reduces the incidence of falls. Yeah. As I mentioned before, the research on this topic is relatively inconclusive, but it does appear that the use of side rails may in fact not reduce the incidence of falls. In fact, side rails can actually increase the risk of falls as elders try to climb over the side rails to get out of bed. And that's because they can't lower the side rails from in the bed. You have to reach over and, okay. That is correct uh, okay. because side rails is a form of, of restraint. restraint. <laughs> okay. Now, there are patients who perhaps are, or elders who are cognitively intact and therefore, um, they may want a reminder to call the nurse or to, to, to call their caregiver. But when you're seeing, especially patients who may have a little cognitive impairment, side rails actually may increase their, their risk for, for falls. 
Okay. I, I found that awfully surprising the first time you mentioned it, and, and I, I still find it amazing, but it makes perfect sense. Uh, and you know, this whole uh, fall prevention process provides a tremendous amount of uh, uh, opportunity for things, uh, for facilities, staff uh, to consider, also family members, as you mentioned. Is there some kind of a, uh, how shall I say, maybe a cheat sheet, a way to have a quick reference reminder on some of the things that we need to keep in mind? Oh, there's a wonderful acronym that I came across a couple years ago uh, by, uh, by Campbell and, and, and colleagues. And the acronym is I Hate Falling. Now, what this acronym does, it focuses the direct care staff on what are some of the key issues in falling and fall prevention. Let me run through that acronym now. I. I stands for inflammation of joints or joint deformity. It's important to remember that as joints become deformed and rigid, elders may have problems with gait and movement. H stands for hypertension. This means that we need to be aware of the possibility that hypertension, particularly postural hypertension, can cause falls. When patients are on blood pressure medications, the antihypertensives, mm -hmm. we need to monitor them so that we can ensure that they are not bottoming out when they stand up. A stands for auditory and visual abnormalities. Once again, make sure that appropriate hearing aids and glasses are available to rectify any sort of auditory and visual irregularities. T means tremor. Residents who have neuromuscular issues may have difficulties, particularly those with Parkinson's, because the typical shuffling gait that they use will increase their risk of tripping and falling. E stands for equilibrium problems. Again, make sure that there are no throw rugs or other impediments to balance. F indicates foot problems. If there are issues because of bunions or other foot ailments, then the risk of falling may increase. Mm -hmm. Thus, the services of a podiatrist or the use of orthotic shoes may be helpful. Anything that will improve the movement of the foot is a plus, it's a must. A is to remind us of effects of arrhythmias and heart blocks. Many of the medications commonly used to treat these sorts of medical conditions can contribute to falls by lowering pressure.